my student, I'm happy to meet you the second semester on the course Business Policy and Strategy 2. We earlier had this lecture, but Business Policy Strategy 1, the first semester. So we'll continue where we actually stop in the first semester. Now, the course code, as we know, will now be BOSS 412. And the course title still remain Business Policy and Strategy. Uh, my details are there for office use and email. Thank you. Now, today we shall be discussing on industry analysis or sectors analysis. But after this class, the learning outcome, after this class, you are expected to learn the following after the class. One, what is an industry and market? You should be able to know Porter's Competitive Five Forces Framework. Also, you should be able to know the key determinant of Porter's Competitive Forces. And to know on industry life cycle. To also know competitors and market. Strategic groups and what is market segmentation. That is not all, or last but the least, and but not the least, uh, we have uh, critical success factors and blue ocean. Now, let's go on. What is an industry? An industry is a group of firms producing products and services that are essentially the same. Example, some uh, example could be in automobile industry, airline industry, manufacturing industry, uh, power, let me say, power electricity sector. Then, industry are often described as sectors, especially in public sectors e.g. health sector or education. Industry and sectors are often made up of several specific markets or market segments. Then, in this, a market is a group of customers for specific product or services that are essentially the same. Now, in this context, we are looking at a market as the customers that actually stimulate the industry. And it is only when market is available that you have business. So if there is no customer with identified problem or need, then there is no market. Then, we will now look at three main topics and provide different frameworks and concepts for understanding the industry analysis. One is industry analysis through the use of the competitive five forces framework, which examine five essential industry forces. One, the competitors, Customers, potential entrants, suppliers, and substitute. The two additional factors which are added here are complementors and network effect. These two additional factors can is hardly for you to see it in any of the textbook because some this is a new uh, 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 identity of these two forces, adding with the five we have before, earlier identified by Michael Porter. So, together, these forces and factors provide an understanding of industry, attractiveness, and competitive strategy. Also, 
fundamental industry structure and dynamics, which include examination of understanding economic uh, industry types and how industry involves through industry life cycles, which may influence changes in the five forces that can be examined with a comparative five forces analysis. Then, competitors group and segment, including examination of strategic groups, groups of organizations with similar strategies and of market segment, group of customers with similar needs. These focus provide a more in-depth understanding of competition with an industry or sector. That is not all. A key determinant of uh, uh, profitability is the extent of competition and the strength of buyers and suppliers. And this varies between industry. That is to say, for you to know that this industry is highly I mean, is highly profitable. The only determining factor is when you discover that competition is not too high. Buyers are of suppliers are not too high, and so on. Then it can stimulate profit. Where competition and buyers and supplier strengths are low, and there is a little trait of competitors, participating firm or industry should normally expect what? Good profit. Should expect good profit. But profitability between industry can force vary considerably. For example, in the pharmaceutical industry, has performed very well, while other like the airline industry in Nigeria have failed, have underperformed. Even if we are to mention another one, the, the, the energy sector, you talk of Nepal, there is no stable light. Just just few minutes ago, we started this recording before you know they took light. So the industry is actually underperform. Then we look at Porter's competitive five forces framework. What are these forces? Michael Porter have had earlier identified for a very good analysis of the industry. So Michael Porter Five Forces Framework help to analyze an industry and identify the attractiveness of it in terms of five competitive forces. These include extent of rivalry between competitors. Two, trade of new entry. Three, trade of substitute products and services. Power of buyers and power of suppliers. These are the five forces that Michael Porter postulated and he actually indeed confirmed that these forces have the ability to squeeze your profits if they are too high. But where these five forces are low, the industry is very, very good for you to invest. So these five forces together constitute an industry structure. See figure below, which is typically fairly stable. Porter's main uh, message is that where the five forces are high and strong, industries are not attractive. Take note, please. Where the five forces are very high and strong, Please, there is no any good investor should invest in such kind of industry because it will squeeze all your profitability. Then, excessive but, uh, competitive rivalry, powerful buyers and suppliers and 
the trait of substitute or new entrants will all combine to squeeze your profitability. So, in a situation where these uh, forces are low, you should know that it's a signal that you should can, you can invest as of that time. But where these all of these forces are too alarming, are very stable in that environment or in that kind of industry, you are advised not to actually invest because it will squeeze the profit. You will be running at a loss. Now, we can see the Porter's uh, Five Forces Framework. Looking at it, we look at the colors and as each of them as earlier identified by Michael Porters in 1998 for a thorough industry analysis. Now, let's take these five forces one after the other. Competitive rivalry. In a competitive rivalry, factors that tend to define the extent of rivalry in an industry or market is as follow one competitors concentration and balance competitors concentration and balance if a competitor has already concentrate and is balanced you don't dare enter into that kind of industry if not that competitor will definitely use all his energy i mean the financial muscles to squeeze all your investment. Two, industry growth rate. Of course, in a situation where the industry growth rate is high, do not, do not, do not venture into such kind of industry. If not, you will always be running at a loss. You will never make any growth. High fixed cost, high exit barrier, and low depreciation. Now, when MTN was on ground before the glow, MTA make a statement that if you credit your uh, your account, assuming hundred naira, a time frame will be given to you when that money hundred naira should finish. If not, they will take away whatever is you have credited. If the day have elapsed, but when glow came, they saw that niche, that gap. They have created, you can see the, the competition between the two. Glow now make their own statement. We will not take your money until when your money finish. You will continue using your credit until your money finish. God finish. So, for that reason, it is expected to see how the two market competitive rivalry now begin to struggle. Until when MTN has no choice rather than to blend with what the Glow came up with so then secondly the trade of new entrants how easy it is to enter the industry influences the degree of competition the, the greater the trade of entry the worse it is for incumbent in an industry an attractive industry has high barrier to entry that reduce the threat of competitors. So under this threat of new entrants, we are expected to have the following in mind. One, economics of scale and experience. How many of this industry can buy in a large quantity so that they will enjoy economic of scale and experience? Two, access to supply or distribution channel. Some of this industry that you are into, you don't even have a very good supply or distribution channel. But your competitor do. So once you have a, 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 a challenge in that manner, the, to, to enter again or to operate very well in that industry would be difficult for you. Then thirdly, expected retaliation when your competitors behave in this way what next do you do so then next is 
the legislation or government action or government policies why that government policies concerning this new entrance of this kind of industry the incumbency advantages those companies that have been there before you will actually eventually do well or find a way to silence you as you are coming in but we should know of course that business is war but the war of conflicts of what interest so Every businessman or woman will always do everything possible to remain the giant within the environment. That is not all. Trade of substitute. Substitutes are products or services that offer the same or similar benefit to an industry, product or services, but have a different nature, have a different nature. For example, Dango Testament and Boa Cement, Bonvita and Milo. These are two different companies. But they, you see, if you cannot buy Dango Testament, you can buy Boa Cement. But you should know, by an attempt for Dango Test to increase the price, the prices of uh, the, uh, I mean, the price of one batch of cement, Boa may likely retain his own to, in order to get more customers, or go and use what we call the penetrative price method. You will reduce the price, the more. Then Bonvita, if Bonvita is too high, so many persons will run to Milo. So be assured that if, be assured of this, that if two products are highly competitive in time of substitute, you don't dare increase the price of one, the whole customer will switch because customers are always what price sensitive. Secondly, there are two important points to bear in mind about substitute. One, price slash the performance ratio is critical to substitute trade or substitution trade. Two, extra industry effect are the core of the substitute uh, 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 concept. Then, power of buyers. Buyers are the organization's uh, immediate customers, not necessarily the ultimate customers. If buyers are powerful, then they can demand low prices, of course, and costly products or uh, service improvement. Buyer's uh, power is likely to be high when some of the following points are in place one concentrated bias two low switching cost three bias competition trade and then four low buyer profit and impact on quality then we now move to the fifth one by uh, the power of suppliers suppliers are those who supply the organization with what it needs to produce the product or service, as well as fuel, raw material, equipment. These can include labor and sources of funds. The factors increasing supplier power are converse to those for buyers power. First, supplier power is likely to be high where there are one concentrated suppliers. Two, where there is high switching cost. And then three, supplier competition trade. And then four, differentiated product. Now, complementary and network effect. The five forces framework has, has to be used carefully and is not necessarily complete. You must not use all in one aspect, in, in, in a particular area. But you may pick the one you feel is very, very essential for the growth of the company. Some industry may need the understanding of the six forces. 
Organizations that are complementers rather than simple competitors. You know, there is a, an organization that is a complementer to you, is not a competitor. So such kind of competent, such kind of organization that can the presence of such kind of organization can help the growth of your own organization. They are complementers. They are not uh, uh, actually uh, uh, competitors. They are complementers. So for such kind of industry, I mean such kind of complementers, you need them around you to actually motivate your company or business. An organization is your com complementer if it enhances your business attractiveness to customers or suppliers. On the demand side, if customers value a product or service more when they are also have the, 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 the other organization product, there is complementary, the complementary, uh, sorry, complementary uh, with respect to customers. For example, mobile apps providers are complementers to Apple and other smartphone and uh, tablet uh, suppliers because customers value the iPhone and iPad more if there are a wide variety of what apply uh, appealing applic uh, apps to download whatever they want to download. So. We should know the effect of complementers and the effect of a competitor. They are not the same. That is not all. Value network. Customer may need may, may not only value a product more if they only um, if they also have another product or service. But if other customers use the same product or service for a different purpose or the same such kind of products have a valued network when kind of relationship is established such kind of valued network is actually going to impact positively on the performance of your own organization or company now this will now lead us to look at the industry analysis. Or the, the, let me say the industry life cycle. Now, when we talk of industry life cycle, we are proposing that industries start small in their development or introduction stage, then go through a period of rapid growth. The equivalent to adolescent in the human life cycle. Now, uh, looking at this, you will, it will reach, reach you to what we call shock out. A shock out is like after your growth stage, you reach a shock out. You have not actually reached what we call maturity stage. The final two stages are first, the period of small or zero growth, which is maturity. And... And then the final stage of decline, old age. So we have, it, when you matured and reach to a level, the peak at which you can maximize your potential. But you reach to a level where the potential will begin to drop, and that is your old age. You begin to think of some of the things you cannot do again. Then the power of the five forces typically varies with the stages of the industry life cycle. This is very clear. Whatever you use in the early stage, or we call it the introductory stage, or the development stage, you can never use it when it is maturity. These five forces that Porters have earlier identified. You can see the diagram here uh, actually show clearly that under the development stage, it is expected that if we have low rivalry, there will be high differentiation, innovation, and what? Innovation key. So if there is low rivalry between, because if you are just coming to the company, I mean, you are just establishing the business, you will have less people who are going to compete with you. 
until when people watch carefully and discover that you are making profit in this business, then they will now begin to come with very sophisticated way of fighting the business with you. And because of that, you are at uh, the what we call development stage. So it is expected that you have a high differentiation uh, innovation key. So secondly, moving from development, you go, move to growth stage. Low rivalry again, you will now have high growth and weak bias, but low entering barrier, growth uh, ability key. These are the, the variable you will always consider when you are at the growth stage. Then the shock out is in between your growth and the maturity stage. At that stage, you may be thinking that you have gained ground. You have not. You have not gained ground. Competitors are watching of this that they will find a way to see how they can bring you down. So increasing rivalry here, slower growth will come, and some exist managerial and financial strength key will be put in place. So then from the shock out to what we refer to as maturity stage. The, the, the stage at which you have reached the maximum of your potential. So, stronger buyers will lead to low growth, of course, and standard product. Of course, you have to do standard product to meet up with high competition around you there. But higher entry barrier make share and cost key. Then the last there is the decline stage. Extreme rivalry typically many exist and price competition cost and commitment key. These are the things you look into. And it is in this uh, the, the last stage that R&D can be conducted. When you see that you have R and D will mean research and development. You can go over where your competitors are actually fighting you. Where can you do well than them? And so on. And that will actually help to see how you do well in your competition. Then, competitors and market. An industry or sector may be too high a level to provide for a detailed understanding of competition. The five forces can impact differently on different kind of uh, places which require a more detailed understanding. For example, Toyota and uh, Honda may be in the same growth industry, automobile, but they are positioned differently. Let's know that. So, because a good number of customers will tell you the difference between Toyota and uh, Honda. They will tell you, we pre I prefer Honda than Toyota. And then another customer will tell you good reasons why he prefer Toyota than Honda. And so on. So they are protected by different barriers to entry and competition and competitive moves by one are unlikely to affect the other. So if there is any competition, a, a competitive move between between Toyota and that of Honda, it, can, it cannot affect the, the other one. That is just what we are looking at. So then, this will now lead us to look at what do we mean by strategic groups. Strategic groups are organizations within the same industry or sector with similar strategy, characteristics, following similar principle and strategy, competing on similar basis. So when a company is actually in what we call strategic group, is actually facing those kind of companies that are actually producing, having similar strategy, having the same kind of product packaging and everything, almost the same. So it will be difficult for you to get out if they have more competence hands or sell men to go with their business. Then market segment. A market segment is a group of customers who have similar needs that are different 
from customer's need in other part of the market. So when you discover that they are all customers coming to your shop, you have a barber saloon, and then they are all coming, then you now discover that some are highly classified in the way that they don't want to sit in the same place where other customers are sitting. Then you open a room for them, special for such kind of uh, uh, a customer. That is a niche. You have created a niche because now the treatment you will give them in that special way will attract more income again. But if you look at it, it's the same services that you are rendering to these people, the common one, and the same services you are rendering to them. But just that they don't want a, a situation where they sit with a common man. So, for that reason, you create a market segment. And then, in creating a market segment, the following are to be taken note. One, variation in customer need. Because if customers have identified this is what I need, of course, do that. Specialization, and so on. So, now, the last here we are going to discuss is on the critical success factors and blue oceans. Now, the canvas highlight the following three uh, 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 futures. Critical success factors are those that either are particularly valued by customers or provide a significant advantage in terms of cost. There is nothing more than that. Then secondly, value curves are graph or graphic depictment of how customers perceive competitors relative performance across the critical success factors. Then we have value innovation is the creation of new market space by excelling on established critical success factor on which competitors are performing badly and or by creating new critical success factors representing previously recognized customers once. Now, when we say value innovation, the ability, you are in the same industry with a particular person, but you now create a new idea within that industry to attract the other customers that all of you are all fighting for. So, that single act will lead you to what we call value innovation. And it will increase your performance or you increase your sales and profit. Now, a value innovation is a company that competes in blue ocean. What we mean by blue ocean here is opportunity. Blue ocean is new market space where competition is minimized. Now, the competition here is not too strong. It's very at a lower stage. People are not there to tap such kind of opportunity. Then, such kind of area where you discover is a blue ocean. Blue ocean contrasts with red ocean. Where industry is already well defined. Good. Take note. In a red ocean, industry are well established, are well defined, and they have rivalry around them. The rivalry is even intense intense is very very aggressive now blue ocean involve white empty seas where red seas uh, red oceans are associated with bloody competition and red ink in other words financial losses so if we look at it very well critically organization or industry or sector which we want to invest in if they are not looking as blue ocean, don't dare enter there. Because the red ocean will squeeze all your, whatever you have, your asset, and then turn it to losses. And we can see, red ocean are associated with what? Bloody competition. The competitors can go extra mile to, 
to diminish or to, to, to destroy the whole of your progress or whatever you have put in place in business. And I've always said this, that business is war and a war of conflicts of interest. In Africa, uh, business is war with bloodshed. In Africa, and particularly in Nigeria. So you can see the extent at which someone can go to damage your image of your business, and so on. So thank you very much for uh, listening for this lecture today. We have come to the end of the class. Till we see next, and then we'll discuss much, much on uh, the next topic that we are going to look. Uh, well, the next topic we are going to look at is on case analysis. We are going to look at how a company will be, a case will be given to you. You sit down and analyze it. And what are the guiding principles for you to analyze a good case? At this stage where you are now, 400 level, moving toward ending of your, uh, uh, finishing your program, it is expected that you can analyze cases. And in case analysis, we say read the case twice under exam condition. Read the case twice under exam condition. And that is not all. Take note of the silent point. And what are these silent points? It could be uh, you have a, a graph. You could see a, an account statement. You see balance sheet. You see income statement. Do not overlook all this exhibit. They are potential items that will help you to analyze your case very well. Also, use your total knowledge you know about, about life. If you have knowledge about finance, you have knowledge about uh, human resource, you have knowledge about entrepreneurship, you have knowledge about business math, you have knowledge about economics, use your whole total knowledge, organizational behavior, research, and all of that, production management, Oh, so when you are analyzing a case, it means that you should come with the totality of your knowledge. So by the grace of God, by the next uh, class, we are going to see how we can analyze a case. We identify problems in that case, and also solution to the case, and then also recommendations that will advise for that organization to use in order to improve the financial stand and highly competitive with their competitors. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.